As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a very special guest tonight, Dr. Arthur T. Bradley. He's a senior engineer at NASA. He's an Army veteran, martial arts expert, author of multiple books on preparedness, and also, most recently, author of the Survivalist series available on Amazon. Dr. Bradley is here with us today to talk about a very particular type of threat to anyone who lives in an industrialized country. Dr. Bradley, thank you for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Sure, thank you for having me. You've written recently about the reality, the risks, and the types of threat that come from an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. And it's a bit um, ironic that bringing this up in the preparedness community, because so often the most characteristic uh, caricature that's sometimes portrayed of people who are consider themselves preppers is they talk about, well, you have your tinfoil hats ready, and people talk about protecting yourself uh, in that way. But what we're here, what we'd like to find out more from you tonight is to really take a a scientific and engineering look at what is the real credible threat of an EMP and what would it what would the impact be of that what would likely sources uh, be of that and how can people take simple direct action to help reduce the risk of impact of that to their lives and their family so first of all if you could help our listeners know who you are and why you're specifically qualified to talk about this subject Sure. Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. Um, if you search the web, just sort of EMP and how to protect against an EMP, you'll find lots of sort of advice, and some of it agrees and some of it disagrees. So I, I really recommend people, you know, ask the questions of who is it that's telling me this, and are they really the right person to be listening to? So each listener can decide on their own whether I'm that person or not, but they should at least ask that question. So I think it's where you should always start. So a little bit about me, I think you mentioned I work at NASA during the day, uh, which all that means is that I'm a, a technical engineering sort of guy. Um, I have a Ph.D. in electrical engineering from Auburn University. Um, I'm a certified EMI, EMC engineer, and of all of my credentials, that's probably the one that's most relevant to this topic, and that really just means that somebody has, you know, professionally worked in the field of electromagnetic interference and compatibility, um, and there's not that many of those folks out there, but it means that they, they sort of their day job is working with electromagnetic stuff, so that's something that, you know, I can at least tout. Um, I'm also a licensed professional engineer, and I've worked for, oh, I don't know, the last 15 years or so helping NASA through various problems, Most of them, many of them related to EMI, EMC. So just from a technical standpoint, I have a pretty good background. I'm not going to say I'm the leading expert in the world on electrical engineering, but I have a pretty good background in the field. And so I can talk about some of the you know, important aspects of an EMP that, that maybe somebody who didn't have engineering background couldn't really talk to. Well, let's start that with that. Uh, what is an EMP? Right. So an EMP, as you said, just an electromagnetic pulse. And really all that is is it's a, it's a very short duration in time pulse of electromagnetic energy. And so it can be caused by many different things. I mean, we probably all know when you have a storm go by, if you're watching television or something, and lightning strikes nearby, you'll get a little zap on the television, a little disturbance. And that's really due to the electromagnetic pulse that the lightning puts out. Um, it's a very high current event that happens, and it sort of puts out this broadband pulse. And anything, you know, electric, electronics-wise can pick that up and somehow transmit it in ways you can see it. So the lightning is certainly an electromagnetic pulse. The sun also emits things called coronal mass ejections and solar flares, which can cause... Uh, electromagnetic pulse events at Earth as well. Um, and then the one that we're talking about mostly is uh, high-altitude uh, nuclear-generated electromagnetic pulse. And that's really when you take a, a nuclear or atomic weapon and you detonate it in the atmosphere. You can detonate a relatively low atmosphere or a higher atmosphere if you want to get a broader area of impact. And there's some unusual phenomena that occur in the atmosphere when you do that, but you basically generate gamma rays and the gamma rays end up perturbating uh, the Earth's electromagnetic field, if you will. That's felt down at the surface of the Earth in many different ways, and we can talk about why that is. But that's really when people are talking about EMP, 
they're really talking about those nuclear-generated EMP um, events that happen. And that's a very different kind than the kind that would be just be caused by natural occurrences. So what kind of countries are capable of initiating that type of an attack? Uh, well, anybody that, any country that has two things really could do an EMP attack. They have to have some type of missile that can get up high enough, and they have to have a nuclear warhead that they can detonate. And so you can go down the list of, you know, sort of nuclear-armed countries in the world. But the two, I think, that are probably... The biggest threat, maybe, maybe you can add a third one in, but the two that are certainly the biggest threat for the United States would be China and Russia. Uh, and Russia has made numerous threats throughout the years. Um, they're very familiar with, they did EMP testing back in the 70s, just like we did. And they're very, very familiar with the possible effects. And they've made very open comments about, you know, well, it, not if we detonated an EMP over your country, you wouldn't do this, you know. And so they've been pretty overt about it over the years. China hasn't been that way. Um, they sort of operate in a different way, but they certainly possess the ability to do it. And the third one that might be a candidate, you know, that we sort of consider on our unfriendlies list would be um, North Korea. And North Korea, if we follow the news, you know, they're always working on their on their rocket technologies so that, you know, they're trying to get something that can reach continental United States. And if they were even today without that full ability, if they were to take, let's, you know, maybe a trawler into the Gulf of Mexico and launch a missile up into the atmosphere and detonated over maybe the eastern seaboard or something, they could really fundamentally change life in the United States for many years to come. Um, estimates of even a single EMP over the continental United States, especially on the eastern seaboard, could be like a trillion dollars or more um, e in economic effects on the country. So you can imagine what that would do um, from a single launch of a single missile. So. You know, it's, it's a real threat. I think there are others that could do it as well, but I think those are probably the most likely uh, candidates. That kind of extensive damage, what, what kind of damage specifically would an EMP cause? Yeah, so that's where a lot of the misinformation uh, sort of gets out there. Is, you know, there's been a lot of fiction written on EMPs. It's, it's good fiction. It's good stories. I enjoy reading them like everybody. Um, but so there's some things are known and some things are not known. And sort of the best data we have is from uh, something called the EMP Commission Report. And basically, the government got worried and put a bigger, a big panel of experts, and they sort of studied this question, you know, what would be damaged? And, and so the data that I sort of spout and typically uh, tell people is from sort of that report and what I've pulled from it. And so we can kind of go down the laundry list, but the biggest effect, without a doubt, would be to the nation's electrical grid. So it just ends up that these long transmission lines really take energy in very well. They act like these sort of nice antennas, and they pick up that electromagnetic energy. And they can, in turn, have so much current flowing in them that they can damage these very large transformers that are used to condition this power on this grid. And those transformers are, are very expensive and very hard to build. Um, and they could take many months, if you took enough of them out, many months to be replaced. And so that's sort of the biggest threat. If you think about, well, what happens if you know, 70% of the continental United States was out of power and would be without a power, let's say, for six months. You know, it's, it's unlike any event we have, would have ever seen. And so that's sort of the big threat, taking out electricity, because it's sort of the lifeblood of everything else, right? It, all of the other infrastructures depend on it. Um, and we can talk about that to some extent. But So the electrical grid is one. Um, the other one that is specific to a nuclear EMP, now not to a solar EMP, but a nuclear EMP is a very broadband event with really fast rise time on its very first pulse. And so that can actually couple into very small electronics, just, you know, your cell phone or your laptop computer or, or your automobile or whatever. Um, so it can couple enough energy into those to damage uh, modern solid-state electronics. So computers could go, certainly control systems like for water plants and, and, you know, anything you can kind of telecommunications and those kind of things, air traffic control systems, all of those things are susceptible um, so you can imagine, now not everything would be damaged, but you know, let's just say a percentage of all of these items were damaged. The, the amount of chaos that it would cause and the disruption it would cause would really be even hard to imagine. Um, but so the nuclear MP possesses that unique ability to really reach down and touch individual devices all throughout people's houses and everything else. Um, the one I want to touch on just a little bit that gets sort of misreported is about automobiles, and that's because... Many times in fiction, it, it makes great fiction if you just sort of make all of the cars in the world stop working. I mean, then it, everybody's got to sort of hike everywhere, and it's, you know, it's interesting. 
Um, in reality, it doesn't seem the data supports that. Um, it, it sort of goes like this. The cars that are operating, that you're driving, maybe about 70% of those would stall out or would have some kind of anomaly on them. So maybe the dashboards would go flickery. Even if they kept running, they would just, you would see some kind of electrical anomaly. Your radio would go spastic or something. Of those, some percentage of them, let's say a third of those that started having weird anomalies would just stall on the road. And so you would essentially lose power to your vehicle. So you, know, you can imagine that's you know, maybe one out of every six cars on the road all of a sudden just sort of stalls. I, you know, imagine what that would be like, right? Uh, and then of those, maybe one out of every three of those would be permanently damaged. So maybe about 5% of all cars and trucks that were running in the United States that was in the area of this effect would immediately be damaged and not be able to be restarted. And, you know, that might be on the order, well, you can figure 300 million vehicles at any time, and maybe half of those are running. You know, so you might be talking about 7 million cars in the blink of an eye that all of a sudden didn't run, and many more than that that started having problems. So while it's not as bad as maybe the fictional stories like to you know, sort of portray, it would still be incredibly bad, and there would be accidents everywhere and stalled cars everywhere, and it would be a pretty enormous feat to try and overcome just that one thing by itself. So that maybe that gives you a little feel of, kind of the kinds of damage that could occur. Well, when you mentioned cars that were in the uh, immediate area that was being affected, how widespread could the area of effect be in, the, in one of these events? Yeah, so it's really a line of sight event. A lot of RF stuff is sort of based on line of sight. And RF is so, radio frequency. Yeah, it's RF radio frequency. And so if you launch, a, uh, let's say, a missile up into the atmosphere, anything above about 25 miles. So there's sort of a region from... 25 miles to about 200 miles, where you would ideally like to detonate this missile. Um, and that's because you get some, you're above what's called a source region, and that source region helps to sort of magnify the effect. So you want to put it up above about 20 miles, 25 miles, and the higher the better. If you can get it up close to a couple hundred miles, you can essentially see almost all of the continental United States from that one vantage point. And so in theory and in simulations, a single nuclear warhead, even a very modest one, detonated at that kind of altitude, a couple hundred miles, could take out about 70 to 80 percent of the continental United States. So imagine if you really corrugated, you know, a Russia attack wouldn't be one missile, it might be ten missiles, and they would be spread accordingly to ensure overlapping coverage. And all. So you, it wouldn't take much to take out a vast, you know, swath of the United States in terms of this kind of damage. In the face of that, how can people conceivably protect any of their personal electronics or their or their cars yeah so cars are sort of the the i mean everybody wants well what do i do i've heard i've read all kind of things from dragging a chain behind your bumper to you know various things and the truth of it is on automobiles there's really not much you can do um, if your vehicle's not running if an event were to happen and your vehicle is in the garage it would almost certainly survive um, if you were on the road you were unfortunate to be you know driving to work or driving on the interstate um, you know, you'd have a pretty good shot of your vehicle surviving, but you'd also have a very good shot that something would happen. You know, you would, you would lose power for a brief period of time, or, you know, but at least it would probably restart. Um, so, but there's not much you can do to really protect it uh, without having an engineering degree and really spending the time on, you know, how to reduce noise in electronic systems. Uh, and it, wouldn't, it just wouldn't be worth the time and energy. Um, you sort of are, are sort of at the luck of the dice in terms of your vehicle. So all of the you know, the hype that people say about, oh, you know, you do this or you do that and you make your car less likely to be affected. I don't, I don't really see any data to support that. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, you could, you could cover your car, for example, if it was stored. I did some testing for, for the book, Disaster Preparedness for EMP Attacks, and where I built a homemade car cover, a conductive car cover, and I covered up my car and we, I did RF testing to see how much it protected it. And you know, it did a pretty good job. It took about 95% of the energy that was incident on the car and, and shielded it from the inside. So, you know, you could develop something special like that if you were, like, really, really wanted to protect it. Um, but by and large, you're sort of at the mercy of where you are and what's going on, um, you know, in terms of vehicles. Now, in terms of personal electronics, there is a, a quite a bit more you can do. Uh, most people have probably heard of Faraday cages. But just in case you haven't, it's basically just a an enclosure, a full 360-degree enclosure, so, you know, bottom, top, all the sides. It's a box, a metal box of any shape. And, you know, ideally it's a solid surface. 
in a perfect world, it would be like a solid sphere of aluminum or something like that. And you put your stuff on the inside and close it up. Now, it could be a, you know, like a box that you've wrapped in aluminum foil. Um, it could be you know, many different ways. Uh, aluminum gar- I mean, galvanized steel garbage cans are used frequently where you just sort of put your stuff inside the garbage can and put the lid on and tape the seam around the outside. Um, and all those things work pretty well. Um, in the book, I do tests of lots of things that people had suggested from ammo cans to microwave ovens to garbage cans. Um, and, and all of them, you know, if you take the right precautions to tape up the seams with conductive tape, um, they do a pretty good job. And the truth is most of them would very likely allow small-scale electronics to survive if they were placed inside of them. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of review people can search the web and sort of find what they, they think works for them. The ones I like in particular, um, I like just aluminum wrapping a box if you, with a lid on it, which is a nice, simple Faraday cage. And I have some pictures on YouTube. Um, my username is Disaster Prepper. You can just search that, and you can find videos of me building the little boxes. Um, I like those because they're very simple, and I also like um, the anti-static bags, or some people call them EMP bags. And they're basically bags meant to for putting electronic boards in them to keep them from being damaged by static electricity. And I've tested numerous kinds of those, and I, there's a, the very best kind um, is a type called Dry Shield. That's it's just a particular uh, name of the bags. Um, I sell them on my website, disasterrepair.com, but they have them many places on the web. You can look for them. Um, but those are great because you just stick your stuff in the bag, fold them over, put a strip of tape across the top, and you're done. So it's a nice, convenient way to do that. You mentioned that you did some testing. How do you go about testing uh, the effectiveness of a Faraday cage or a bag? Yeah, it, unfortunately, that's probably the question I get asked the most is, you know, I built up a Faraday cage, now how do I tell if it's any good? Um, and unfortunately, there's not a really simple way for someone without test equipment to do that. Uh, so you basically have to have a few pieces of equipment. One of them is um, a signal generator, which lets you sort of generate the frequencies of interest. The other one is an amplifier, which amplifies the signal so that it's large enough so you can transmit it. And then the third thing you need is an antenna. And so all of that spells a lot of money, um, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And so if you have that test equipment already handy, you can do shielding effectiveness tests, you know, in a matter of hours. It's not a big deal, and I've done a lot of those tests. Uh, but if you don't, it's much harder. Let's say you you built up your trash can, and you're like, yeah, but now how do I know if it's any good? And one thing people will do is they'll try these two-way radios. They'll put it, one of the two-way radios inside the, the can and then try and talk, you know, put the lid on. They'll try and talk inside the other two-way radio. And unfortunately, they always get the signal through whatever they've built. You know, they always, it always transmits through it, and they think, oh, my can is no good. Or, but in reality, that test is not a very good test. It's very, very difficult to block a two-way radio signal, um, as you can imagine, because they're meant to pick up very faint signals. Um, so the only way I have found that people can really check a Faraday cage, and it's, it's not a great way, but it's a way, is you can, let's say, let's say you want to check out a static bag, and you're like, okay, I put my, my two-way radio in here, and I turned it on, and I've got my other one, and I seal up the bag. Now, if I try and talk to the radio, it will still work. It will still get through the bag. Um, but if you do three layers of your Faraday cage, so you put a bag inside of a bag inside of a bag, let's say, if, you have, if those are all very good quality Faraday cages, that is about the right amount to block a two-way radio. It takes about three layers. So it's not a great way because, you know, who wants to build three layers of anything? But it does give you a way, especially if you were just checking anti-static bags, a pretty easy way of checking out your anti-static bags. If you bought cheapo ones uh, and you put three of them together, they still won't block the radio. Four of them probably wouldn't block the radios even. Um, So the shorter answer is it's hard to test them uh, without the right test equipment. Um, But if you have a good Faraday cage, it takes about three layers to block a two-way radio. I'm thinking back to the movie... Uh, Enemy of the State with Gene Hackman and Will Smith that came out about uh, five or seven years ago. And, and in that, uh, the Gene Hackman character is ex-CIA, I think, and he's he's built this entire, in this warehouse, basically an entire laboratory for himself. He calls it the, the bug jar, and he lives inside there. And, he, and the whole thing is made out of, like, copper mesh. But it's full of holes. It's not solid like what you're describing. So that's a follow-up question is, can your Faraday cage have holes in it? And does it need to be grounded? Yeah, two great questions. So 
it ends up that what really matters most about a Faraday, so the short answer is yes, your Faraday cage can have holes. In fact, it can have lots of holes. Um, you can build a great Faraday cage out of, you know, a fine mesh, like you can think of like a screen door. Um, small holes are fine. It ends up that as long as the holes are tiny with respect to the wavelengths of the incident wave, then they, they essentially acts like a solid surface anyway. Um, so what really matters most is that you don't have any long seams. All right? So if you have your choice between a one-inch diameter hole in the middle of your Faraday cage or a very thin one-inch seam, you would take the hole every time, although that seems so counterintuitive. But it ends up that these narrow seams, these slots, they act as something called a slot antenna, and they let in this uh, electromagnetic uh, energy quite uh, efficiently. And so there's an interesting experiment I do on, the, on uh, YouTube where I take a galvanized garbage can, and I just put the metal lid on it. It's nice and tight, and I put a spectrum analyzer inside of it so I can measure the signals. And then I measure them, and it ends up only dropping about what, they, what, what we call, and we measure in decibels, but it drops about 10 decibels of the signal, which is about 90% of the signal. Uh, the problem is that's not very good. You want to get like 50 dB or so. Of, you, know, you want to drop about 99.7% of the signal. And so what I show is that if you just run a seam around the outside of that can where the lid, where the lid goes on top of the can, if you run a strip of like copper tape or aluminum tape, you drop from 10 dB to maybe about 45 dB with just that single strip of tape. And so it really highlights the importance of those long, narrow seams and how they can let in the energy. So that's, that's critically important. Um, so, yes, you can have small holes, um, but don't have any long seams that haven't been taped up. And what about now, grounded? Yeah, the grounding question, I think, is, is probably due more to misunderstanding. So we ground things all the time. Um, especially we earth ground them, uh, and oftentimes that's for lightning protection. So the idea is, you know, lightning strikes nearby or lightning strikes a rod, and you want to shunt that energy away to earth as quick as you can before it has a way to find its way through your equipment. And so grounding is really useful in that way. Um, and there's other reasons for grounding too, but that's sort of most relevant. Now with an EMP, the energy is, is not that kind of, you know, uh, find its way through every part, I'm going to shunt it away. Um, it's a, it sort of sets up a field, uh, a high high intensity electric field across devices, and it ends up that if you have a, a really good Faraday cage, 360 degrees like a box or something that you've made up, grounding it won't have any benefit whatsoever. And so going to all that trouble, I've seen people you know attach ground leads and then they attach an earth ground and drive a rod into the earth. It, if anything, it oftentimes causes their Faraday cage to not perform quite as well. Um, so I don't, I don't recommend grounding a Faraday cage. It's not necessary. All the experiments we do with things stuck in Faraday cages uh, are never, the Faraday cages are freestanding. They're just sitting on tables, and they do a great job of blocking fields. So uh, I don't see any reason whatsoever to do that. Speaking of putting things inside a Faraday cage, what sort of items would you recommend people consider putting in a Faraday cage if they want to protect themselves? Sure. So, you know, uh, we can talk about broader preparedness in general. So a Faraday cage is just like, you know, one little aspect of a very specific threat of this nuclear EMP. Um, just, and just so I don't forget to say, if you, if you have a solar-generated event that causes an EMP, you don't need a Faraday cage because that energy does not couple into small electronics, okay? So this is only for nuclear-generated EMPs. But the kind of things people often talk about storing in it are any kind of, like, electronic medical devices, you know, like a backup system for if you had glucose meters or whatever things that, you know, you might use for health monitoring that would be important. You can certainly have ham radios or any kind of two-way radio systems that might, you know, so you can imagine if everything sort of went to hell in a handbasket and you couldn't communicate, you know, any way of communicating would be, would be useful. Um, shortwave radios are also nice. You could tune in if there's some emergency broadcast, you could tune into those. Um, and people have gone down the list, everything from disposable cell phones, which, you know, the, you have to question, well, would there be any self-service? And likely there would not be. But nevertheless, you know, anything that's sort of small-scale, oftentimes used for communication. Other people have suggested things like uh, red dot sites, for example, for your, for your rifle. They don't want their, and I understand we don't want those to be damaged, so maybe store those away. Um, things that you don't normally use on a day-to-day -day basis that you think in the times of real emergency you know, might be beneficial. And every person's sort of a little bit unique in that way of what they use and what's important to them. But that's kind of the idea of it. 
Well, how do we really prepare for something like this? Uh, because the effects are broader than just that that first moment. And you mentioned before the 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 uh, the uh, incidental effects could be uh, broad and extensive across uh, the economy, across the uh, the in industrial and you know technology infrastructure. So, how do you go about preparing for the for a risk like this? Right. So this is one of those you know high impact low frequency events, right? That and there there are others that you know super volcano explosion or an asteroid hitting the earth or other I mean things that really fundamentally disrupt life um and for some period of time it's you know it's not like in a week everything would be back to normal. Um and so those kind of those kind of preparations I mean you it's not something you can do in a day or a week. You really have to sort of take a broad look at you know how do I make myself where I can sort of sustain myself if I lost all of the support networks. And you can start wherever you, everybody can start at different places. And, you know, I walk through a lot of this in the Handbook to Practical Disaster Preparedness. I sort of walk through the different needs and, you know, starting maybe with food is the first thing people think about. And, okay, yeah, I should stockpile some food. That makes sense. And how much you stockpile is sort of up to the individual. Um, I always tell people for just sort of normal emergencies, normal disasters that we might face, you should store at least 30 days of food in your house. Which a lot, that was probably the thing I take most criticism for is, you know, you said you should only store 30 days of food, but you know, we, things could last much longer. And, and I'm not saying only store 30 days. I'm just saying that's usually enough for most events that you will have in your life. 30 days is enough to right the ship. Now, an EMP, that's not a normal disaster. That's a very different thing. And so it's certainly, you know, if somebody really wanted to be prepared, maybe they would store six months of food or a year's worth of food. Um, but if you've never stored food before. Start slow, learn what to store, how to store it, or you can end up wasting a lot of money to spoilage and other problems. So food is one. You know, again, the types of food you can store, you can, you can learn that as you go. Um, water is one that a lot of people forget. You, don't, you can't store a year's worth of water. Most people can't anyway um, because it's just too heavy and too much volume. But I always say that for normal emergencies, every person should store enough um, for about two gallons of water per person per day for at least two weeks. So worst comes to worst and you have no water service, you've got two weeks of water supply. If you're rationing it, two gallons of water is not a lot of water, a gallon for drinking, a gallon for cleaning yourself up each day. So sort of just like a ballpark of about 28 gallons of water per person. Um, again, that's for a normal kind of emergency, right? That's like all right, I give myself a little buffer to gather supplies, you know, Again, an EMP is not a normal emergency. So what you have to do for water, typically since you can't store it, is you have to identify some alternate sources. And you have to have ways of purifying and cleaning that water, making it safe to drink. So all of us, luckily, we live on a planet where most of us have water in various forms from rivers and lakes, and, and you can go on down the road and find different things. And so uh, you have to figure out what's close to you, how you could retrieve that water, how you could purify that water and sort of have a sustainable plan where you have enough water, you know, to sort of maintain hygiene and also keep yourself hydrated. So, so food and water are sort of where it all starts. And then there's a whole list. I think I list 14 different needs that sort of people have to hit. Um, you know, if you rely on any kind of electricity for anything, you have to have some kind of little backup system for that. Could be solar powered. Um, the, you know, people say, oh, I have my generator, and that's fine for sort of short-term emergencies. If you've ever had a generator, you know what I mean. They drink fuel like it's crazy. They, they go through it very quickly. Um, and so, and, you know, you typically can only store about 25 gallons uh, legally in the United States uh, or you'll violate the fire code. So, you know, you might only be able to run your generator for a few days. Um, so generator is generally not a long-term kind of solution just because of the fuel problem. So you typically have to go with, you know, solar or wind or something uh, that's sort of renewable uh, that you can keep charging up your batteries and using your batteries to run something, uh, and that kind of thing. So one thing I do recommend people, if you don't have a generator system that you, you know, know and trust and really rely on, is to maybe look at getting an inverter, which is basically just a way to take the power from a battery and turn it into uh, AC power that you can plug, you know, your lights into or plug your washroom machine into or whatever, that kind of thing. Um, so an inverter, you could do some, people can do some homework on different size inverters and what's important about them, but a battery system, an inverter, and then something to charge the batteries. That's sort of the three elements 
of sort of a renewable system. You know, some way of charging the batteries, use the batteries to run the inverter, plug into the inverter and run your equipment. So, so electricity is another one of them. And, and you can go on down the list, personal protection and firearms and on and on and on. But it's a, it's a long-term, really dedicated um, person who can focus on sort of surviving these, you know, these high-impact, low-frequency events because most people will be grossly unprepared for them. Um, and so, you know, again, so you start small, you make it where you can survive for a couple of weeks, if anything, then you build that up to a month, and then you figure out, you know, how do I go from one month to six months? What does it take? Um, and it really is it's sort of a life change to be able to do that. And uh, if people want to find out more ab about your work, where can they go for more information? Uh, well, they can go uh, to my website, is disasterpreparer.com. Um, there's some free information on there. I put out like some kits for your cars that people might th keep things in their cars or just some general preparedness information on there as well. Um, and they can also certainly search the web. I have various videos and on Amazon, various books for sale uh, about general preparedness as well as EMP attacks. Um, so they can find me pretty easily. Arthur Bradley, if you search Arthur Bradley, you can usually find something. I can personally vouch for the usefulness of your book, The Disaster Preparedness Handbook. My son gave it to me as a gift, and I've enjoyed it thoroughly. It's, uh, when I first started this channel, it's like something that I had imagined I might be able to create, but realized quickly as I started, I didn't have the background information. I had uh, some specific knowledge in very limited areas. I had intuition in a lot of other areas, but mostly what I became aware of was uh, that I mostly had uh, ignorance <laughs> in a lot of areas. So I found that book of yours, the Disaster Preparedness Handbook, particularly um, helpful because of its breadth. It just gives a, a really uh, thorough overview of many different aspects of what types of uh, emergencies are, are do occur, are likely to occur, how extensive they can be, and what goes through, like you said, a, a lot of uh, different life necessity uh, aspects and how, what considerations you might want to do to uh, prepare for those in some areas that I certainly hadn't thought of. So I um, uh, really appreciate the, the depth of breadth of thought that you've put into this and, and the generosity that you've brought to sharing your insights with, with uh, people all over through your work. So if anybody uh, wants to uh, uh, get in contact with you, uh, is there any, any way that uh, they should? Uh, sure, they can go to the website, disasterrepair.com, and then at the bottom there's a contact me link you can just click that and it sends me email. Very good. Dr. Arthur Bradley, author of the Disaster Preparedness Handbook and several other books, including his recent fiction series, the Survivalist series, uh, including your most recent episode of that just came out. What was the most recent title? Yeah, the most recent one just came out two days ago. It's called Dark Days. So check that out on Amazon, folks, and uh, we look forward, uh, hopefully, the, uh, Dr. Bradley will be willing to come back and, and address some of these uh, other specific topics. Today we spent most of our time talking about EMP, but uh, if we could talk with you about some maybe uh, even higher frequency uh, uh, risks that, that people should be aware of or prepared for, uh, we'd like to have you back again. Sure, that sounds great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.